Let's see what is intrinsic activity. We also call it intrinsic efficacy. Now intrinsic activity or intrinsic efficacy is a measure of the efficacy of an agonist receptor complex to evoke a cellular response. For example, agonist A binds to a receptor. This is our agonist A. This is our receptor R. They both bind together and form agonist receptor complex. Now consequently, the receptor is activated. This red color represents the active receptor, uh, shown here as star. So AR star represents the active form of the receptor. And this then eventually leads to a cellular response, which is translated as an efficacy of the agonist. Now the double arrows represent the rate of association and dissociation of agonist and receptor. For example, the forward arrow represents the rate of association between an agonist and the receptor, while the backwards reaction represents the rate of dissociation of the agonist receptor complex. Now at equilibrium, the rate of association of an agonist and receptor is equal to the rate of dissociation of the agonist receptor complex. We have discussed this in last lecture, so you may refer back to that. Let me switch back to the topic on this slide, which is intrinsic activity or intrinsic efficacy. So intrinsic activity or intrinsic efficacy is the measure of the efficacy of an agonist receptor complex to evoke a cellular response or it represents the efficacy of the agonist. So for example if we have an agonist which causes more activation of the receptor it will lead to higher effect or higher efficacy or we may call it a full agonist. Now full agonists have an intrinsic efficacy equal to 1 or which is 100 percent. Now if you could notice here the longer red arrow means that the rate of association of agonist A to the receptor R is higher than the rate of dissociation of agonist receptor complex. The shorter blue arrow represents the slow rate of dissociation of the complex which could be a situation in case of full agonists. On the other hand, if we have another agonist which causes lesser receptor activation and hence low efficacy or low effect, we call it a weak agonist or a partial agonist. Now, for weak or partial agonists, the intrinsic activity is between 0 and 1 or less than 100%. This was 100%, so this is less than 100% in case of a weak or a partial agonist. In this case, if you could closely notice the length of the two arrows, the rate of dissociation of the activated state is higher than the rate of association of the agonist and the receptor. Look at the length of the arrows and compare it to the length of these two arrows. A very striking point to be noted here is that a full agonist would stabilize the active state of the receptor more than the active state of the weak or partial agonist and hence the intrinsic activity of a full agonist would be higher than the intrinsic activity of a weak or partial agonist. Let me show you the intrinsic efficacy of some common mu opioid agonists according to which Fentanyl possesses the highest intrinsic efficacy as compared to heroin, morphine, and buprenorphine. We also know that fentanyl, heroin, and morphine are all full agonists, whereas buprenorphine is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor, and thus a weaker analgesic than fentanyl, heroin, and morphine. Let's have a quick look at all this again. A full agonist binds to its receptor, causes a higher receptor activation and thus greater downstream signaling and consequently leading to a large effect. 
And as we have just seen, the intrinsic activity of such an agonist is 1, and 1 means 100%. A fentanyl, heroin, and morphine are full agonists at mu opioid receptors and thus stronger analgesic compounds. On the other hand, a partial agonist would bind to its receptor or would bind to the same receptor and cause a partial activation of the receptor and thus smaller downstream signaling and consequently leading to a partial effect. Now recalling from the previous slide the intrinsic activity of such an agonist could be anywhere between 0 and 1 or in other words between 0 and 100 percent. A tramadol and buprenorphine or partial agonist at mu receptor and thus weaker analgesics. Let's see what is an inverse agonist. Now an inverse agonist as the name implies is an agonist which would bind to its receptor and produce an effect which is opposite to the effect of the agonist and obviously the intrinsic activity or the intrinsic efficacy of such an agonist would be minus one. Inverse agonists may bind to the same receptor as the agonist but typically have the opposite effect on the target cell. We call it negative intrinsic activity or minus one activity. The overall effect resembles an antagonist so sometimes they are referred to as antagonists. Now antihistamines are basically the inverse agonists at H1 receptors. Now, several drugs that have been conventionally classified as antagonists, for example H2 antihistamines and beta blockers, have shown inverse agonist effect on their corresponding receptors. Among beta blockers, carvedilol demonstrates low levels of inverse agonism. It must be noted that by definition an antagonist would just block an agonist on the receptor site and will not possess any intrinsic activity. And this is how we make a distinction between the antagonist and the inverse agonist. So the intrinsic activity of inverse agonist is minus one whereas the intrinsic activity of an antagonist is zero. So it does not possess any intrinsic activity. Now in this slide let me show you how to interpret the intrinsic efficacy of four different agonists on a graph. We have a full agonist and a partial agonist and a full inverse agonist and a partial inverse agonist. So if you want to draw this graph it's pretty straightforward. Draw two x-axis and a y-axis. The y-axis shows the percentage response or percent effect of these agonists. The x-axis has four bars. As you can see, for the full agonist, for the partial agonist, for the full inverse agonist, and for the partial inverse agonist. The y-axis is split into two halves. It starts at zero and goes up to 100% on the top and minus 100% on the minus plane. So a full agonist has fully activated a set of receptors and it has shown a 100% effect. Or we may say that the intrinsic efficacy of this full agonist is 100%. The partial agonist has partially activated the receptor as you can see here and its intrinsic efficacy is around 60 percent. This looks like 60 percent here. On the flip side, the two inverse agonists are showing intrinsic efficacy which is less than zero. Like for example, the full inverse agonist, this is our full inverse agonist, shows a full negative efficacy of minus hundred percent. Whereas the partial inverse agonist 
shows a negative intrinsic efficacy of around 50 percent and its intrinsic efficacy is thus minus 50 percent so for routine interpretation we call this hundred percent as one and this minus hundred percent as minus one so this is our zero this is one and this is minus one now intrinsic efficacy of full agonist is one this is one the intrinsic efficacy of partial agonist is between zero to one the intrinsic efficacy of full inverse agonist is minus one and the intrinsic efficacy of partial inverse agonist is between zero to minus one and lastly the intrinsic efficacy of a pure antagonist is zero this is zero because a pure antagonist binds to a receptor however it is unable to activate the signal transduction pathways now let's see how different types of agonists show up in a typical concentration response curve a full agonist displays full intrinsic efficacy a partial agonist displays partial efficacy whereas an inverse agonist displays negative intrinsic efficacy